Welcome to Dig Deep, the mining podcast. In this podcast, we go deep into mining news, hot topics, and live interviews with mining professionals and leading figures in the mining industry. Introducing your host, Rob Tyson, founder and director of Mining International and Mining International Executive, a leading global mining recruitment and headhunting agency. Hi, mining community. Welcome back to another episode of the Dig Deep, the mining podcast. And today's guest is John Black, who's a natural resources and energy director at BDO, uh, BDO UK, who are an international network of public accounting, tax and advisory firms, which perform professional services across a multitude of industries, including obviously the mining industry. Um, John is a qualified accountant and has worked for some of the biggest uh, companies in this space. Um, and he is here today to tell us more about some of the challenges mining companies or entities are facing in, in the uh, industry today. So let's welcome John to the podcast. How are you doing, John? Yeah, hi, Rob. I'm good. Good, thank you. How are you? I'm good as well. So um, obviously, I understand that you're an avid listener of the podcast. Um, so as we always start these, I wonder if you can just tell us a little bit about yourself, about your career and about your background. Yeah, pleasure to be here, Rob. Thanks, thanks for having me. So, um, I'm as you say, I'm an audit director in the natural resources sector yeah, at BDO, uh, based in the UK in London. I've uh, been there for about a year now. Um, we're a team of uh, nearly 200 people, sector focused on natural resources and energy. Um, and I, before that, I was focused on capital markets. So, that, so I worked with a lot of mining companies in the past, but I wanted to set to specialise and sort of build up that expertise. And it's how I got attracted to, to BDO. And what did you begin just tell us about BDO? Um, some Obviously, some people out there may have, uh, may have heard of the company, but don't actually know. So I just wanted to just give us a, uh, an overview of the overall company. Yeah, absolutely. So BDO is a, a global accountancy firm um, offering the sort of full suite of services from audit, tax, and advisory, various different sectors. Uh, we audit sort of 300 listed companies in London, um, of which nearly a third of those are natural resources companies, which is the, the largest number of sector credentials for any accountancy firm. Um. And obviously, you work in the natural resources division. Obviously, uh, obviously, a bit for specialisation. So, I just wondered if you can just tell us a little bit more about that particular division and some of the work that you do within mining uh, and the natural resources sector. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, I mentioned the sort of sector focus and the importance of that. I think is really it enables people to develop an expertise on the sector. Um, I mentioned we're about 200, just short of 200 people, um, all focused on that at the moment. Uh, we've got a really fortunate enough to have a really experienced sort of senior partner and director team. Um, and that experience sort of trickles down into the rest of the team, sort of enables them to, um, or empowers them rather, to have that knowledge to be able to go and give a really quality service, good quality service to, their, to the entities that they're working with. Um, and really understand the challenges of the industry and the sort of financial reporting implications of, um, of of those challenges. I think we're pretty unique in that we've got a really sort of good breadth of uh, entities that we work with. So we've got anything from junior explorers through to uh, FTSE 100 listed mining groups. And I think that sort of experience is unmatched largely in the UK. So we get a really good understanding of uh, the full process that, that mining companies go through. Um, and, and we're not just based in the UK, so we, we're a sort of global outfit, as we mentioned. Uh, we're regularly talking to other key offices in the sector, Australia, US, Canada, South Africa. Um, and we attend sort of global mining conferences together. So, we're, so it's all about communication, sharing ideas and what's going on in each of the different regions we operate in. Um, and that gives us a, a sort of really unique position, really, to be able to go and produce thought leadership pieces and um, mining analysis. Uh, and a, a really good example of that is a, um, a publication that we're just about to launch, which is focused on Africa and, and the role that they have in the global mining industry. Um, and obviously talking about Africa uh, and this podcast is uh, when it goes out, 
Um, we, you'll be at the Indaba conference. So anyone that's listening um, to this podcast uh, on the day it gets released, which I think is the 6th of February, um, you'll be at the Indaba conference. So I encourage you, if you, uh, if you want to um, arrange to have a chat with John, um, to do so, he will be at the conference and his team will be at the Indaba conference. So um, please reach out to him. Uh, some of the details will be in the show notes of company. So I thought I'd just plug that in there. Um, as a firm, how do you demonstrate your understanding of the, the challenges uh, that companies face in the sector? It really goes back to those points. Um, I think that it's it's all about our um, developing that expertise within the, within the sector. So having that focus, um, the understanding of how that translates into the different stages of the mining company and being able to work across the full suite of, the, of that process just gives us um, a, a sort of unique selling point in the market, I think, in that we can understand and work with entities from the whole whole industry, different stages. Um, and, and really, it's, it goes back to the point we were just talking about, that full leadership, having that experience across the, across the globe um, in different regions and being able to produce reports such as the the one I just mentioned this this um yeah um going going back to Africa and their, their role in the global mining industry. Um obviously you mentioned the the report that you've uh, <clears throat> recently released. Um can you just tell us a little bit more of uh, about the role of Africa in the global mining industry? Yeah absolutely so um yeah you mentioned it Rob, earlier that there's a there's a theme. So we try to align with the Indaba theme, being the time of year that um, people are heading off to, to Cape Town for the the world's biggest mining conference. Um, I think the theme of Indaba is unlocking the future of African mining. So we try to stay al aligned to that, and we've looked specifically at critical metals and the supply demand challenges that we've got. We're expecting to have in the future, um, and the importance of Africa in that. Uh, in, in that mix uh, so there's lots of facts and figures around um about around that supply and demand uh, for critical metals the latest one that i heard was that we're expecting demand to grow by up to 500 percent by 2050 which is which is obviously huge levels of demand uh, we haven't got those levels of supply so um, it's all being driven by the green revolution and the world needs to keep up essentially in, in how we develop those supplies and those volumes of metals needed to to deliver on various sort of net zero targets and decarbonisation plans that are being set by governments and companies across the world. Um, so we've got uh, countries in Africa which are already sort of already leading the world in some respects in production of uh, critical metals, some critical metals. We've got DRC producing cobalt and tantalum. Um, and we've got South Africa producing, the sort of leading the world in the production of uh, platinum group metals. But I think that aside, it's, it's largely what we, what we see is it's a very underexplored area. It's got huge potential. There are estimates that Africa holds 30 to 40% of the world's mineral reserves. So strategically, it's going to be very important in the race to produce those critical metals in the future. Um, there, are, there are obviously reasons why they're not at the forefront of that right now. And there are lots of challenges hampering Africa's growth and those types of things are, go back to the investment climate being tough and uh, political landscapes that many of the countries face make it very tough for investors to, to be able to make those investments, particularly for um, greenfield exploration projects. Um, infrastructure is another key key area where there's um, there's a challenge to overcome there. So governments need to focus on uh, the gaps in the infrastructure, particularly in the transport, which can for some of Central African countries and the landlocked countries make it very difficult to export commodities and expensive. And then you've got sort of clean water access and power infrastructure issues, which um, which yeah add, add to those challenges for for investors. Um, we, there are also social licensing is very, um, very important in, in Africa or across the world, but particularly in Africa, um, the need for companies to understand um, local communities and working with them as stakeholders for the business. Um, and, then, and then we've got obvious 
uh, challenge around climate change and ESG, which is um, a lot of the places where the mines operate in Africa are under serious physical threats from extreme weather. So there's a, there's a big opportunity. I think the, the takeaway from that report is um, big opportunities. China's investing annually more than $100 billion into Africa, um, and 25% of that is natural resource focused. So if you're if you're a miner who um, wants to tap into those underexplored reserves um, and you've got that clear understanding of how natural resources can benefit communities and the social licensing aspects, um, and you've got a responsible use for those resources, um, and you can, you're willing to invest in clean energy and water infrastructure, I think there's huge opportunities there in the future. Um, obviously, talking about investing, um, and I'm not sure ne necessary if it's something that you get involved in with, as a business. Um, and obviously, there is potential to invest in, obviously, the, the mining industry. And if we're looking at Africa, um, do you see companies uh, looking to invest further, um, whether that's from outside finance um, or even companies wanting to invest their own money further. If we look at the end of towards the end of last year, it seemed it was very hard to um, attract finance. There, there seemed to be a little bit of a dip, but I think everyone's got an optimistic outlook for 2023. Do you see any of this with obviously some of the companies that you're that you're um, helping, obviously on their financial reporting? And I suppose what's the what's the common theme about? investment with some of the companies that you're you're dealing with yeah so um particularly making that answer i think particularly focused to africa certainly i think what we're seeing is that there are lots of investment opportunities um it, it's cheaper i think the general trends tend to be focused on um acquiring existing mines and trying to expand the reserves and resources around the existing mines. That, that's, that tends to be what we're seeing at the moment. So greenfield um, exploration opportunities are, aren't as common as they have been. Um, and the investment particularly, I think, has been focused on um, different, different alternative types of, of funding. So typically your stock exchange listings and the fund, secondary funds um, listings have been less common and we're expecting that trend to to continue and for sort of more private companies to be entering the space or um yeah alternative financing packaging i think it, is, it seems to be something of, that we're moving towards in the future and what about do you see anything around sort of joint ventures or companies buying other companies again are you privy to some of that information if you're speaking some of your clients on obviously their financial reporting do you see that happening over the course of this year more activity around um maybe joint ventures or even buyouts yeah there's quite a lot of MA activity i think in the market at the moment so there's um there's more common um as i mentioned the financing that fits in well with sort of farming agreements and as you mentioned joint ventures those types of arrangements within the sector so particularly where there are plans to acquire existing mines, sort of end, typically end of, end of mine life uh, for a large major mining company. And they've got bigger and better projects to go and focus their, their resources onto. And there are real, real opportunities for um, private companies to enter the market, I think, and acquire those types of mines with plans for expansion um, on sort of brownfield areas around that mine or, um, yeah, well, or, or lots of different different options, really. But yeah, we're, we're seeing that type of investment really picking up um, and, and maybe people moving away from the typical uh, stock exchange listing that, that have been the model that's been followed in the past. Um, what do you think will be some of the key trends for the industry uh, over the coming years? Um, good question. I think the... Um, but it's interesting that we sort of moved, we're almost completely away now from the, the pandemic, which is um, which is good uh, in many respects. Um, so that that's something that I think is of the past. Um, we're continuing to see the usual trends with commodity price variability, 
Um, we're coming off sort of really strong prices in 22. I think general expectation is they, they're going to come down um, in the future, going through 23 and, uh, and forwards. Um, so operational efficiency is at the forefront of a lot of um, entities' minds and making sure they're maximising profits uh, with that expectation that prices are going to come down. Um, talent shortage, I think, is one that's it's not new. It's not residing either. It's something that we've, in the industry, not just in, in mining, but in the accountancy industry as well, I think it's something we need to address. Um, I think there's a couple of things there. I think there's the education of the next generation um, and trying to you know, explain, make, make the uh, draw the linkage, I guess, to the green revolution and the importance of mining to that. Um, there's, a, there's a real perception, I think, of that next generation that mining is a really dirty industry and we need to work together, I think, within the industry to, to educate them on, on how responsible mining is really important and critical to all of our futures and, and, and the green revolution in particular. Um, and I think the talent shortage is also meaning that um, many miners are sort of focused on how they can optimise their processes um, in a number of ways, really, but not least uh, digitalisation. And that's, a, that's something that we're expecting over the next couple of years to be a real area of, um, of development. Um, so I think, the, I think many people would accept that the industry is a little bit behind others in terms of digitalization and the way that using Internet of Things um, has, has happened today. There's a real possibility that some of the big tech giants could come into the space and uh, diversify, further in integrate their uh, supply chain so they can secure their supplies of the future. So the likes of Apple and Tesla, it really, really surprised me if they, if they entered the space. Um, and focus on things like automation, uh, remote control, artificial intelligence, um, electrical ve electrical vehicles in the space is not really taken off yet. I think um, we're quite there to have a sort of um, full mining fleet of electrical vehicles. Um, so that there's lots of lots of change needed there, and I think we'll start to see that really um, materialise. Uh, and there's, uh, the the benefits from that, I think. Are, are obvious, but there's there's the things like health and safety incidents um, coming down as a result of um, yeah, remote control. Um, there are um, lots of different efficiencies that can be taken from digitalization, uh, both both in terms of lower costs and sort of decarbonizing the process at the same time. So something I think will be um, we'll see come through uh, quite strongly. Um, the geopolitical situation, I think particularly the um, events unfolding in Eastern Europe uh, has put this sort of at the, at the front of a lot of managements um, of all its entities' minds. Um, political instability and trade conflicts are making it more difficult in the supply chains. And you've got social licensing um, as, a, as a really important, growing importance to the, to the industry, that communities are stakeholders, they're, they're there's an investment made uh, of time and resources into all of the stakeholders. Um, and, and that links into uh, ESG, I think, which is we haven't mentioned it really yet, which is, I think, is the, if it hadn't already been, it's now sort of moved into that sort of number one overall key trend. It's at the top of most entities' risk um, register. Uh, it's really having a sort of far reaching. Um, impact on the industry, which um, for, for an industry that typically operates over the long term, for the shifts that have happened in a relatively short space of time, it's, it's pretty striking really on how it's impacted uh, the industry. Um, obviously, mentioned uh, talking about ESG. Um, why do you think ESG is presenting a bigger risk to the, to the mining industry? Um, obviously, you mentioned it's probably a, a, a number one challenge or even a number one um, priority at the moment for, for most of the mining companies out there? Yeah, definitely. I, I think it would be fair to say that it's, it's reached the top of most um, miners' risk registers. Um, so it's easy. I think it's probably easier to look at it as a risk than it is as an opportunity. I think there's, there's elements of both there. Um, but looking at it as, as a risk, it, it affects or it links to, in some way, all of the other sort of trends and risks, I think, that, that face the industry. So you, 
you could link it to a talent shortage and going back to that point on educating the next generation um, uh, around why metals are important to ESG and, and, and the Green Revolution. You could go back to digitalization and the processes being more efficient and reducing emissions there. Um, and then there's the sort of physical uh, threats presenting from climate change. A lot of the areas where the miners, miners operate are subject to some of the most extreme weather that are coming out of climate change. So there's physical threats there. Um, there is the the impact on commodity prices so uh, and the demand for green metals. So it's impact. It, it's got the ability. It has got the ability to drive what we're mining for and the, the impact that it's having on the prices and the variability, sort of long term growth upwards. Um, so it, I mean, it's affecting every part of the business. And of course, in the investors, the investors to invest, you, they need to see strong. ESG credentials in a company to be able to make that investment. It's um, it's got a really far reach and it's impacting all aspects of the business. So I think what what we're seeing is that companies need to have acceptance of, of this, and they are having that. And then we need to turn to transparency over the ESG policies and processes and the credentials. And um, one of the way that tends to come through is through disclosures and the annual report. Um, what are the financial reporting implications on companies of uh, TSFD disclosures? Disclosures. Yeah, so the, so the TCFD disclosures are um, sort of the, the most uh, prevalent in terms of um, yeah those disclosures that I mentioned in the annual report. So. Premium listed companies in London have had to adopt this for a year now, and um, we're just moving into a cycle where standard listed companies have now got to adopt it for the first time, mandatory. Um, so companies have been, been taking steps where they've been where they've adopted it for a year. They'll be taking steps to improve um, what they what they built and build on what they uh, disclosed last year. Um, and similarly, standard listed companies will be looking towards those premium lists and trying to understand what, what to get to grips with what those disclosures mean for them. And there's plans in the future for um, aim listed and larger private companies to have to adopt this as well. So it, it's really important. Um, the key sort of requirements of the disclosure are focused around four core areas, which are uh, risk management, governance, targets and metrics and strategy. Um, the, the disclosures generally are, are different to how they've um, how they've been disclosed in the past, so that they are essentially, it looks at how the business um, is impacted by climate change rather than vice versa, which is historically how it's been. Um, the, the disclosure, the TCFD disclosures are sort of deliberately meant to be Adopted, adoptable by a number of different industries and companies. Um, so they're, they're deliberately broad. They're, they are producing industry-specific guidance. Uh, so for the natural resources sector, that's expected this year. Um, and it's a real opportunity. I think the, the distinction between having um, the disclosures now focused on how business is impacted by climate change gives businesses the opportunity to really tell their story and sort of demonstrate the steps that they're taking to reduce the, the direct impact on climate change and society. Um, the, the sort of trap to fall into, I think, is uh, not setting too ambitious targets, so keeping your targets realistic. Um, it's, a, it's an opportunity, I think, for companies to sort of draw that linkage that we've come, that we've just mentioned a couple of times to, on educating the next generation, how important their um, strategies are to unlocking the green revolution, and there's lots of there's lots of, of guidance available on this. There's FRC, who's our um, industry regulator, thematics reviews that you can go and look at if you're a standard listed company adopting this for the first time. Um, and there's there's an initiative actually that I'm running on climate change in the natural resources sector. So we we had a first article on that at the back end of last year. And um, yeah, we're going to follow with more in the future. So um, watch this space. Yeah, um, I've got a couple more questions. Um, in terms of obviously financial reporting, is there anything companies probably 
need to improve on? Anything that you see companies, you've seen the same mistakes on companies when they maybe give you all of their documentation for you to then do the financial reporting. Is there anything that companies may need to improve on? So I think um, as with most things, financial reporting, it, it tends to be uh, the transparency and um, making sure that users really understand the issues that the business is facing. So if you're going to re reference that to ESG and the TCSD, TCFD disclosures, it's trying to really explain what the business is doing and what the sort of culture of the, and the governance of the board is in that process, what management are doing day to day, um, and then moving to how it's impact, like what the opportunities are from climate change, what the risks are, how that's impacting the day-to-day -day strategy of the businesses that um, are making these disclosures. So I think there are there are sort of key areas that and, and thematic reviews that you could look at from the FRC, which would give you areas that they're most interested in. Um, but I, mean, I think general, the general theme is transparency. And just making sure that users understand where you, there, there are lots of assumptions and estimates used in, in the mining industry, um, in reserves and um, impairment analysis and so on. And it's the key to, the, to those disclosures are making sure that you've said what your assumptions are and then given some sort of sensitivity analysis and scenario analysis on what that, what that would look like for the company if commodity prices did fall by 20% or um, yeah, all reserves weren't as accurate as, as they stated in or the management thought they were in their life of mine models and so on. And lastly, um, what's the outlook for uh, BDO? Um, and, and I suppose in, in relation to the, your division, the mining resources division, um, and also is there anything else like, you'd like to add and share with our audience? Sure. Well, I think the outlook's um, really good as a, as a a uh, business which has coverage of the whole mining process. It's really um, exciting time for us to be able to see sort of our larger clients ex exploring and, and um, diversifying into sort of M&A activity uh, and joint ventures with other projects and exploring those brownfield sectors. We're seeing more uh, greenfield exploration projects coming through. Um, and there's a, there's a sort of opportunity, I think, for mining companies in all of the industry to um, to progress over the next couple of years and into the future. So, um, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to working with all of our audited entities that um, are on that journey and, and helping support them together. John, really appreciate your time. Thank you for giving us an overview of um, what uh, BDO are about and um, obviously some of the work that you do within the industry. Um, as I mentioned, you're going to be at the Indaba conference. So anyone listening to this within a, the day or two of release, please uh, feel free to contact John. Um, how can they go about doing that? And um, what social media platforms are you on? Yeah, um, LinkedIn is probably the, the best way. Um, and yeah, I can I can make sure that the contact details are uh, sort of linked into the to this video as when it goes out. Yeah, certainly we we can include all of those in the in the show notes. So um, feel free to reach out to John if you're at the conference, or even if you're not at the conference, please uh, please reach out to uh, John if you've got any um, queries on some of the content um, he's put out there. Any quick questions you may have, uh, obviously around financial reporting um, and anything else that's been discussed. So Thanks, Rob. as as I mentioned, really appreciate your time. Um, thank you for listening. And please share this episode amongst others around the world. It doesn't always have to be people within the mining industry. Um, it can be people outside of the mining industry, especially as we've mentioned on today's show and other shows um, about, I suppose, educating the non-mining people. So appreciate if you can continue sharing the, these uh, podcast episodes um, to great to go obviously give greater awareness across the across the globe in a very exciting industry which seems to be have so much so much about it and obviously looking to grow um, way beyond this year and coming coming years. So really appreciate your time for listening and until next time, happy mind. Thank you for listening. Remember to reach out to Rob via the show notes and be sure to subscribe and leave a review. 
Until next time, happy mining, helping each other to improve the mining industry.